Okay, we will start. Okay, let's get started. It's sharp at nine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Bureau Seminar Series. I'm honored to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Kelly Rose from NETL, talking about improving prediction of subsurface reservoir properties using the power of geoscience, big data, and uh, AI ML methods. Uh, so before we start, let me give you a brief introduction about Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kelly Rose is a researcher, principal investigator, and research portfolio lead uh, with the National Energy Technology, uh, Technology Laboratories Research and Innovation Center. Dr. Rose is also serving as the Interim Technical Director of NETL Science Based AI ML Institute. Her research interests include the uh, uh, development of software-driven solutions to common science data curation, discovery, and challenges. Her work also involves development of uh, new data-driven methods and tools for analysis of energy materials, offshore energy, oil and gas, rare earth elements, groundwater, carbon storage, and geothermal systems. She is associate editor for the Journal of Sustainable Energy Engineering and is also NETL technical portfolio lead for the Advanced Offshore Energy Research Portfolio. She is co-author of award-winning data science-driven tools and models, including one patented, five trademarked, and two copyrighted. She is also co-author of more than 100 published data sets, journal, and technical studies. Throughout her career at NETL, she has had the honor of mentoring and working with more than 45 STEM research interns and fellows. She holds ge uh, geology degree from Denison University. Uh, she got her master uh, from Virginia Tech and her PhD from Oregon State University. So with that, I would like to, to welcome Kelly again. Uh, Kelly, uh, floor is yours. You are welcome to share your screen and start your talk. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you all for this this invitation. Uh, someday I hope to actually get an opportunity to come visit in person when uh, when this COVID crisis is hopefully abated sooner than later. Um, I wanted to emphasize that bio went on and on, and I apologize for that. Um, I probably sent the longer one instead of the short one, but uh, the work that I'm going to present and talk about. I almost had at the end of this title, but it was getting too long um, and teamwork because the the work that our group does um, are, are really products of collaboration through multidisciplinary, uh, multi-effort collaborations and not just within our team but with with outside stakeholders um, like folks there at the BG we actually have a new conversation going with some folks there now um, so as I as I talk through here you'll probably hear me use the pronoun we quite a bit or the team uh, because it really is a team effort it's it's very difficult in data science AI machine learning to to bring solutions to bear if you don't have subject matter experts working in collaboration with those types of experts. Um, you learn from each other, you grow from each other, but you still have your domain space and that benefits the project as a whole. To also set the stage, it's you know increasingly part of our, our parlance, these, these terms, and I, I just throw these definitions up to, to help set the stage a bit because they will be thrown out throughout the talk and I, I don't like to assume that they they are understood by everyone um, in the same way. Uh, just so real briefly, artificial intelligence has been around for a really long time. Um, you know, for the for the students and and younger folks that are that are participating in this in this uh, seminar, you may not even know what this device is, but it's an old school calculator. Um, AI is programmed intelligence. Excel spreadsheets could be considered AI. A slide rule could be considered AI. Anything that is assisting us in what our brain would normally do falls under the definition of artificial intelligence. Machine learning is when the machine is trained to do something. You program it. You, you start to give it intellect. Or um, if it's unsupervised machine learning, the machine's learning to do things on its own. So there was a, there was a big story a few years ago now, it's getting a little dated, um, but it was a major breakthrough about Google's artificial brain learns to find cat videos. And on its own, what made this remarkable wasn't that the brain figured out, hey, there's cat videos, but it figured it out on its own. They didn't train it to say, these are cats. 
the, the brain on its own unsupervised made this discovery similar to how we as humans make discovery as we're growing up um, over time. Other terms that are actually really important in my group and the work that we do is big data um, and big data computing. And there are differences between the two, although they obviously play together. Uh, big data doesn't just speak to massively huge petabyte scale data sets. It can be data sets with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of attributes and features that only adds up to a few gigabytes when you save it to your computer. But the size, the volume, the variety, the variability, or the rate at which the data is coming into you um, is so large that it makes it almost impossible, if not impossible, for an individual person to actually consume that information point by point, measurement by measurement, digit by digit. And so this is where the, the power of big data computing really is important. And this is, this is the transformation that we've all been experiencing and going through over the last decade or so. Uh, it started in the tech industry, social media, online shopping, and is now crescendoed rapidly into the tech, um, the energy space, the engineering space, et cetera, um, using the resources from the cloud and other computing capabilities to handle these large volumes of data and in many instances, but not all, use machine learning AI type capabilities to process and deal with those big data sets. In our group, um, we have, we, we work on a number of different aspects of that big data system. And any group that's doing geodata, geodata science needs to tackle what we call the data pyramid, because if you aren't a good detective at finding data, moving it, getting it and exploring it. So you understand at least aspects of the data, even if it's big, um, you understand the quality of it, you understand the gaps in it, you have to understand the limitations of it, you need to explore it and then transform it to do what you need it to do. You need to be able to combine it, maybe relabel it. Um, and eventually you need to be able to do things with it. Uh, so the, the, the research that we work on spans all aspects of this. There's actually research going on at all tiers of this pyramid. Uh, we're going to mostly focus on stuff near the tippy top today. Um, and it can have impacts when it comes to subsurface spatial systems. Again, the focus of today's presentation, it can really have relevance to all different scales of discovery and exploration with data. Regional, reservoir field, well, even the micro scale. And being able to combine those different resolutions of information and data to derive better insights about these systems and make better predictions is, is one of the goals of, of our group. Um, we've applied this for infrastructure purposes, just basic data analytics purposes, predictive analyses, resource assessments, and again, data curation and transformation applications in a number of, of studies that we've, we've pushed, pushed out over the last few years. Uh, data are not all equal and and data availability while improving hmm, the video has decided not to play that's rude. Um, while there are lots of data that are out in the world, not everyone has access to all the data that, that exists or there isn't data for every place um, that we, 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 we seek to, to explore. And so one of the things that our group has, has focused on in the, the work that we've um, produced is how to use disparate data sets within the context of other knowledge and information products to explore these systems and, and improve predictions. And I'm sorry, the video decided to, to, to fail. Um, you can think of this as akin to when it comes to subsurface predictions, in, in many instances, we get really hyper-focused on our piece of the puzzle, our lease holding, our reservoir, our location. But if we're not looking at least at aspects or surveying the context around us to put a frame around our one piece, that may be the piece that we're most interested in but it still benefits you to kind of cast a wider net to understand the context that that piece sits within, then your ability to do prediction is, is more limited. And with big data and big data computing, um, there's really a, an increased opportunity to actually consume more and more information about the system as a whole, even if you're really only interested in this one little piece of the puzzle. 
because information about that system can help inform what's going on at that local spot. So zooming in to the, the topic today with the subsurface trend analysis and how we've done this to improve prediction of subsurface properties, even for areas with no pre-existing measured data about them. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to walk through the method and then talk a little bit about the uh, the machine learning AI enhancements that we've been we're continuing to work on as a team to uh, enhance it even further. As a geologist, um, I grew up with the conventional subsurface modeling approach and prediction predictive approach. You know, field based observations and interpretations and measurements are really core to to our bread and butter. Um, bring me a rock, I will be happy. And uh, well logs, seismic data, um, the derivative information coming from core analyses of all different types. But the, the key here is with the exception of core and fluid and other property measurements, most of the data that we're dealing with is indirect. Um, even seismic and well log data is infer inferential to some degree. You know, we're using things like sound waves and other physical properties to infer things about the rock and fluids and and system in the subsurface. And we've gotten pretty good as, as a geoscience discipline, geophysics and geology at doing that, but there's still uncertainty with that. We try to mitigate that uncertainty historically using geologic contextual knowledge, our expertise, um, coming from sequence stratigraphy, seismic stratigraphy, basin modeling, et cetera, um, you know, lithostratigraphic models, biostrat, geochemistry, so many different elements that we have to stitch together as we learn about geology and different geologic environments and different geologic systems so that we can make better predictions about what we're observing on these inferential um, measurements. With the subsurface trend analysis, what we've tried to do, what we have done um, in a recently published paper is, is put a more systematic framework around those two big elements, combining knowledge with measured data. So in the STA approach, um, it sounds very similar to what geologists conventionally do, but it's offering up a framework that then allows you to weave in geostatistics and other data science tools in a systematic way, as well as layering in now machine learning AI methods to ultimately be more confident and improve prediction of subsurface properties. Uh, to re reduce subsurface risk, to feed reservoir models and other advanced models more robust information, and improve predictions. A little bit zoomed in just to, to make it easier for folks to see. Um, again, it starts with what data do you have about the system? You may picture perfect data um, for every part of the system just like the blind man and the elephant, your data is disparate. It may be distributed differently, um, but you still have data and measurements. You gather that together and whenever you go out to explore a new location, what regardless of scale, basin, field, reservoir, whatever it is. And we bring armed with us our knowledge of the, the geologic system that we think we're exploring. Um, so these are the first two steps. Learn as much as you can. We often, at least in the in the sedimentary regime, tend to focus heavily on the lithologic aspects of, of the system and, and how it has evolved over time. Um, we, we, we do consider the structural components and the, the diagenetic secondary alteration elements, but they, they often kind of take second, second fiddle, second seat to sequence stratigraphic models and depositional basin history models. Um, again, they, they do incorporate some structural components, but the second step in the STA method is really trying to, to, to say, we need to think about the system and its history as a whole. What has it experienced? How did it get to what it is today from where it was when it was born, when it first, when it first came on the record, whether it's igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic, it actually doesn't matter. Um, the, the method should apply for all three. So looking at it holistically um, and thinking about that history and what has influenced it. Then using that history and geostatistical methods, and we'll get into some examples here in a moment, 
you can use the data and the knowledge of the system to understand areas that have more in common versus areas that are, are less in common with the system as a whole. And then feed that in to, to um, advanced analyses. And again, we'll get to an example of what that looks like here in a moment. Ultimately, the method is stepping you through a process that is still geologic, geophysical, geochemical in nature, um, but is trying to put a systematic framework around the process of how geologists already think when they're evaluating these systems so that we can start to layer in more robust quantitative methods to hopefully incorporate those big data resources that are now available with big data computing and also um, improve predictions. Even some, in some instances, uh, automate those predictions as you'll see in the, in the upcoming slides. You know, geologic systems aren't random. They are the, the result of processes. And we know that. And we've learned as a, as a discipline, the geosciences has learned so much about geologic systems over the last couple hundred years. And so it doesn't make sense to treat them with conventional statistical methods, which assume randomness. Um, the system's attributes are inherited over time. Depending on the age of the system, it has a different history. Um, and it's a, it's a sum of that history, both the genetic properties that it inherited at the time the rock was formed that you're interested in studying, up to the point that it is now and all the things that it's experienced um, over that time. As a result, you know, like I said, you can't, there's, there's been a lot of reliance on conventional statistics and they can still play a role in certain analyses. It's still a good tool to have in your toolkit, but the more powerful tool, at least initially, is, is to turn to the field of geostatistics, which, you know, is relatively young. It was born in the 1950s, tied to geologic systems and the gold mining industry um, to help improve prediction of gold deposits with the variograms and the, you know, the theory of autocorrelation, which by its very nature does not assume randomness, knows that there are negative and positive autocorrelative features that occur in geologic systems that are a result of non-random, i.e. systematic processes. And if we can analyze these with geostatistical, spatial temporal statistical methods, we should be able to do a better job of predicting um, subsurface properties, even for areas with little or no existing measured data in the subsurface. So what are we talking about when we talk subsurface properties? Um, you know, th that's a fair question. <clears throat> and and, and the, the whole target of what the STA method is trying to improve prediction of. So the target is, you know, things like lithologic thickness, composition, porosity, reservoir pressure, in situ pressure, um, reservoir temperature, in situ temperature, permeability, natural fracture, presence, absence, even potentially in certain studies, you should be able to use this type of workflow for, um, you know, more nuanced fracture property predictions. Um, secondary alteration diagenetic and mineralization events, similar to the, the, the Krieg um, studies from the 1950s and, and you know, the, the prediction for ore bodies. This is a whole discipline unto itself. Um, and even things like volume of shale content, et cetera. Um, for the validation and testing of the method, we focused on things that are pretty common in reservoir modeling um, for, for sedimentary systems, because that was the system we were working in at the time. So we focused on porosity, pressure, temperature, and permeability. We uh, focused on our, our work was actually driven by uh, work we were doing in a broader portfolio of research to understand risks associated with offshore um, systems and reservoirs. So we relied upon the, the northern Gulf of Mexico in US waters in the, the field of view that you see here, Louisiana birdfoot, Texas shelf here. Uh, but we were looking at mostly not state waters, we were looking mostly at deep, ultra deep water systems. So that, that's why you see things uh, focused the way that they are. Uh, the data set that we used for measured data in the subsurface uh, initially 
is uh, originally from BOEM. It's a 2012 open source SANS property database. Uh, there's about 13,000 data points that you can see illustrated on the, the graphic here. Uh, and again, the properties that we initially focused on were temperature, temperature, pressure, porosity, permeability. We're gonna, for the purpose of the rest of the talk, we'll just focus in on, on pressure, um, examples of um, the method going forward using pressure as the example use case, but there are published report, there's a published report, a massive one that, that goes into the, the analyses we did with temperature, porosity, and permeability as well. Um, so in the next step along the, the path, you know, the first step is, do you have data for your system, actual measured data, not just knowledge about it? Um, and that was, that was the step that we, we just discussed here for the use case. Um, the validation and testing example in the Gulf of Mexico. And if we're, if we're hypothesizing that the, the subsurface properties that we're interested in studying are not random, but in fact, the product of geologic processes and therefore um, systematic, we should be able to test for that. There's, there's several different spatial statistical tests. One's called the Moran's eye, which confirms if the, if the data is autocorrelative, meaning not random, but systematic. Uh, and in this instance, with the pressure data for these 13,000 plus data points, the, the score coming back from the Moran's eye test um, gave a, basically less than 1% chance this data is random, which should immediately run a flag. You know, if you're, if you're trying to do any kind of conventional statistical analysis, um, that, should, that should raise flags because the, the premise of most, most statistical methods is, is the assumption of randomness. Um, this is clearly not random. This data set is highly, highly systematic autocorrelative. Um, and, and anyone that's looked at a pressure versus depth plot for this type of data in the Gulf of Mexico um, you know, can see that there's, there's definitely a, a correlation here between depth versus initial pressure. Um, the challenge is, and you can say, well, why isn't that good enough? You know, you've definitely got a relationship here, great. But the challenge is when you start to investigate this further, particularly when you get into the deeper subsurface, the variance of the properties, even though they are systematic and autocorrelative, um, the variance is very wide. So at a, at a depth of 10,000 feet below um, surface, you can see that you could have pressure ranging for almost 5,000 PSI which is not very useful when you're trying to do things with reservoir modeling, drilling design, resource evaluation, um, risk evaluation. There's all sorts of reasons why you wanna be able to reduce the risk here. Um, and, and with the STA method, when we get into further steps, you'll see that we've been able to, to accomplish that goal. So the next step is that ge geologic system knowledge. And this is the piece that always, you know, Earns geologists the 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 moniker from the Big Bang Theory and other <laughs> other pop culture references of you know we're we're always straddling that boundary between science and art because we've always had to do a lot of this type of thinking in our minds it's it's abstract you know being able to think in three dimensions four dimensions being able to visualize how did this system form how did it get to be what it is today how do I connect the dots between disparate outcrops that I've I've observed or measured well logs or seismic interpretations and interpolate in my mind to understand how the system evolved, what processes controlled it. Um, but a there's a huge body of literature on most geologic systems now. You know, there's been many of our predecessors out there and you yourselves as well, who have been studying these systems in great detail and the amount of information that is locked up in these publications and reports and maps and cross sections um, is, is huge and it relies on an expert, an SME, to come in and review those resources, understand the system, become an expert, which is good. Um, and in this step of the STA method, you use that contextual knowledge of the geologic system and how it got to be what it is today to postulate areas that have more in common, have seen a common geologic history. If you use the, the analogy of I'm more genetically related myself to my immediate family than I am to the human population as a whole, but we are still part of the same species. I'm trying, we are trying to identify with the domain postulation step in the STA method, those genetic families in the, in the rock record 
based on the lithologic structural and diagenetic history of the, of the system. And, and many of the studies in, that we ended up using here came from you know, UT Austin, BEG, um, Texas-based research teams that have done a ton of work in, in the offshore Gulf of Mexico um, to build up this knowledge domain space. Um, and so the, the polygons that you see in this middle um, figure here represent iterative, um, the final it result of iterative domain postulation hypothesizing. I think this region has more in common within itself to out and then testing with statistics um, and analyses, the data within versus the data around it uh, to refine and get to this point. And it was manual and it was arduous. And the reason that's important is when we, when we go through some of the machine learning AI elements that we're into now, we're hoping to actually automate or semi-automate that piece to, ex to expedite it so that it is not nearly so burdensome um, going forward. But that's a big lift. Um, and this is, this is a fun part. This is based on the geologist's expertise. We got to a point, and the ternaries that you see on this diagram are representing um, that lithologic, structural, and diagenetic influence in a ternary plot based on the geologic knowledge and the expertise from, from folks on the team, um, ingesting this body of knowledge from our peers and saying, you know, we think this one is more lithologically influenced than structural and diagenetic, whereas, you know, domain 21, depending on the age, the biostrat interval that you're in, which is what the different colored dots are referring to is different ages of sediments trying to get that Z space also constrained. Um, the diagenetic and the structural influence varied, um, which had an impact on the, the properties and the predictions that we were able to make. So this step of domain postulation is really important. Um, and it's also an area where we see great um, great opportunity and already are seeing some um, good breakthroughs with regards to the AI ML components that we're pulling in. Um, to do this, I mean, this was, this was an, not, a, not a trivial lift. There were hundreds of publications, thousands of data sets and you know, terabytes of data resources that were again, iterated over and over to, to get to the point where we had what we felt were defensible, um, both hypothesis driven and also data analytically. Um, domain boundaries of areas that have seen a more common geologic history within the domain than to the system as a whole, but they're still part of the system as a whole. Why does this matter? Well, in that validation point, which is the third step on the STA process, you take the data from the system as a whole. In this case, we're using our wellbore data because it's, it's structured and, and easily, you could use seismic attribute data if you have it for for your system, but you need something that you can use for that validation back and forth. Um, and again, for this pressure, we've got this widespread, but we do see a good you know, trend with depth, no shock there. And also we've now color coded it out based on the age of the sediment type. Um, again, this is coming from that BOEM data set, which is a real gem. And then when we look at just for an example, one of the domains, this is domain three, um, you see that the spread is already much, much reduced. And particular when you start to, to pull out the, the different chronosomes, Pleistocene, Pliocene, Miocene, um, the correlation gets even better so that you're not dealing, sorry, with that 5,000 PSI spread anymore. You've, you've already reduced the uncertainty and improved the, the prediction of subsurface pressure for within that domain just in this step. Um, I already talked about these domains on the previous slide, so I'm gonna skip ahead because I, I am watching my clock and I want to make sure I can wrap up in some of the AI ML stuff that we're into. Um, this is all fine and dandy, but you want to make sure in any, any data-driven analysis that you're doing, whether it's AI ML or just standard geostatistics, which is so far, this is big data geostatistics that we've been mostly um, talking about here. You still want to make sure that it's, it's um, defensible, it's robust, and it's, it's doing something better than, than the current, current method. So the, the figure in the upper center here is showing you interpolated predictions um, for one of the chronosomes. And I believe this is Pleistocene, but, but I regret that it is not on the label. I apologize for that. Um, this, is, this is Krieging with no STA influence. This is just the subsurface pressure data for one of the chronosomes. And there's lots of bullseyes. It doesn't look terrible, but it's, it's not a great interpolation. Um, the co-Krieging, 
analysis that we did in this advanced analysis step then uses the domain boundaries as the co-creating factor and saying, give higher relevance to the data inside each individual domain, but still use the information for the system as a whole, because we do know that it's part of the bigger picture of the puzzle. Um, and, and, and it's still a little blotchy, but you're starting to resolve some of these bullseyes. You're getting a more, a more robust picture. A better way to visualize how robust is this is this improving the prediction? What we then did is we pulled in a more modern BOEM data set from 2015 at the time, and um, it included new wells. So the data points that you see on this map on the right are all new wells that were drilled after we started the study, after we had done these initial analyses, and we used these for validation. And the STA was able to, to actually predict the, the subsurface pressure in this instance for two out of every three points out of those new wells that were drilled, including for some of these domains in which there were no prior wells that had ever been drilled. We actually had a really good track record out here in the ultra deep water, we were pretty shocked. Um, two out of three is really good uh, for geologic systems that are already pretty uncertain and, and have a lot of heterogeneity associated with them, but you could do better. And that's that's where we've been moving towards. Um, so in the last few minutes, I'm, I'm not going to dive deep into these topics because each one of these is a talk unto itself. Um, and and there's, there's subgroups from my team that are, are working on these different pieces of, of um, incorporating AI ML into this method, this framework. We've shown that this can systematically improve prediction for subsurface reservoir properties. And and, and with pretty, pretty yeah, good data, but not, you know, if you've got res, if you've got seismic attribute data, if you've got additional data measurements, I mean, imagine how much more robust you could make these predictions. Um, you know, we were working within the context of a specific project and the, the, the constraints that we had, um, but other, other, you know, entities have, have other resources at their disposal that could you know, take this workflow and actually put it to good use to be even more um, robust just with this geostatistical big data approach unto itself. But what we've been doing in the last two years, um, going, going into our last year, um, we have 12 more months on this effort, is, is incorporating different machine learning AI methods into different steps of the SDA method. So we've been using natural language processing so that's the tool that, that can read text and extract information and knowledge out of mm, less structured resources like publications, et cetera. Um, and also um, in this step using um, neural networks for images for things like maps and cross sections and other, other model results to reinvigorate and actually bring back into a more structured format data from what are conventionally been knowledge-based products. Um, and then we have uh, some cluster analyses that we have going on that I'll touch on briefly um, to help with the domain definition step. And this is a, an area where the AIML is, is showing some really good um, potential, uh, but it's we're still in the, the phase of, of applying this. Um, and then in the advanced analysis piece, there's all sorts of different methods that folks can use and, and are sort of tried and true, but we've been really focused on these two chunks here at the front end because this is the biggest lift, the most time consuming. Um, natural language processing for unstructured data. Again, you've, you've got lots and lots of things in journal pubs, in technical reports um, that are, are you know, already really good resources. Um, but just making it faster and easier to zoom in, find the things that are of most relevance to a given, given um, group's um, attention and, and need. Um, we've got a, a pretty advanced search and parsing um, AI ML deep learning algorithm that we've been working on um, that, that actually goes beyond what's, what's illustrated here and is being incorporated into a tool that we're developing to, to automate the STA method. On the high dimensional analysis, cluster-based analysis um, component, you know, the, the measured data, again, we're, we're relying on the, the properties from, from the wells themselves, but you, this is something you could easily extend to seismic attribute analysis and many groups are at this point. Um, uh, but what we're trying to do is, is test using these dimensional analyses, the domains that we postulated as experts 
through literally several years of iteration of, of information and, and statistical analysis and back and forth, you know, hypothesizing this domain, testing it, seeing how things didn't fit or didn't fit, adjusting, um, and uh, hoping to be able to do this more rapidly. Um, in some of these initial cluster analyses, um, high dimensional analyses, we originally hypothes hypothesized 21 domains in the Gulf of Mexico. This is, you know, based on the data and the resolution of what we have right now and, and manual approaches. Um, some of the initial cluster analyses uh, were revealing 25 clusters and it's a little hard to see how that, that is, it's, it's, you know, tricky in a static image like this, but uh, the team has been evaluating this relative to the boundaries we set. And again, doing that iterative approach to make sure we can understand it and explain it. Um, some of the more details here, you know, there's k-means clustering that we've been looking at, but the challenge with this is there's, you know, poor continuity between cl clusters. It's, it's not using contextual information at all, just this is the way this method works. Um, so this one was pretty quickly discarded as not being a robust approach for, for this type of system. Um, Anuj and the group moved on to geohierarchical uh, geo clustering. Um, and the reason for that, um, it's giving a better cohesion score, um, and it's it's you know it's taking into account vector space, three dimensional, and also um, contextual information that's really important on on assessing similarity dissimilarity. That autocorrelative component that we were using geostatistics in the original study for um, this clustering method is is you know explainable by um, and, and logical from a, what do we know is going on in this geologic system that would create these clusters that the, the model is, is bringing out. And uh, he's just doing some additional uh, hyperparameter tuning with variograms and, and other methods that are more robust and, and take it to the next level to try to parse things out even further. Um, so we're still working on that domain de definition step, but we're seeing really good, um, results with the with the analyses that we've been doing and I wanted to zoom back out and you know just one caution for big data ml analytics at, up front when I was talking I was talked about supervised versus unsupervised machine learning it's really tempting whether it's conventional statistics or machine learning based analyses or other data science approaches um, to throw two data sets together cross plot them or throw them into a neural net or some sort of analytical method and say hey look I got a result um, but correlation, this is this goes back to you know forever. Correlation doesn't equal causation. Just because your analysis has shows a relationship, like hey, cancer rates going up, and so is the use of cell phones, it doesn't mean that the results are meaningful or explainable. Um, so it's really important, and that's the process we're going through. This whole effort is a supervised machine learning approach. These are complex multivariate systems that have seen a huge history, millions of years lots of things going on. Um, and, and there are opportunities for unsupervised machine learning to make breakthroughs. There's already been some incredible ones that are published and, and some really neat stories, but they still have to be explainable. Even after the fact, if you get an unsupervised machine learning result and you're like, I think there's something here, being able to go back and explain it is really important. And that's the process we're in. We're in this iterative loop of, we're testing these methods that we think are appropriate seeing if they're gonna help us with the SDA method and integrating in AI ML, but also making sure that we can explain why they are useful, why they are appropriate, why they're better than just the standard methods at, at, at present that are in use. Um, so it's just something to be aware of if you're starting to use or already using data science methods because, um, because it, especially with big data sets, it gets harder and harder to know every data point in your, in your system. Um, but being able to explain it and tie it back to the science and engineering elements that, that are tied to the system you're studying is, is critical. Um, because if it's not explainable, it's going to be hard for, for folks to, to buy into your result. Um, and if you haven't read about the parable of the Google flu, it's getting a little old, it was from 2014, but this is a great article in science that you can Google, it's for free <laughs> um, for download. And it's, it's worth a read because it's a good cautionary tale of how Google tried to use big data analysis to identify flu trends um, back in 2014, and it didn't work. Um, just real brief, and we'll wrap it up. Um, again, we're using some of these other tools that have become more and more de jure. 
um, CNN neural networks and computer vision for image extraction, again, to reinvigorate amazing, amazing knowledge products from presentations, maps, cross sections, et cetera, um, and extract actionable information back out of them that again, can then be used in those cluster analyses and in those domain definition steps um, to help us automate the second step of the, the process. Um, again, this is actually an outdated slide and Brendan, I think is on the line with us here. He's from our team. He's been sinking his teeth into this piece with Anoush and some of the others on the team pretty hard. And I know they've already exceeded this 90% accuracy. And I think they're gone, they've gone past the 500 and 200 validation images um, for the testing. And, and basically, you know, they're using a smaller, this is a smaller subset of information right now for testing and validation. Um, but they're trying to get to a point where you can pull information out and have confidence in the classification and, and what type of information is it? Um, you know, is it maps? Is it cross sections? Can we get the labels out? Can we get the, the actual uh, data off of these things? Again, to put back into more structured databases that we can use for analytics. Um, the last point, you know, this is all being incorporated into a tool that, um, that will eventually help automate this process. Another one that the, the video is refusing to work. Sorry about that. Um, the tools is actually in beta testing now and can and is in use by the team in some of this, this effort. But, but the goal is to, to, again, streamline some of these processes, not completely automate, but optimize and improve prediction of subsurface properties, um, allow for multiple scenario analyses, which also helps with uncertainty quantification and risk reduction, um, or at least risk communication. Um, for a wide range of subsurface purposes. Um, so the tool talk, you know, walks through the domain definition step. There's an iterative loop there. Um, the cluster analysis component is being integrated in. And, um, and again, um, it also incorporates some of the statistical methods. Um, we have another tool. Hmm. I wonder if it's just Zoom blocking the videos because these worked on my computer a bit ago. We have another tool that's actually from a, a previous study called the variable grid method, which helps with visualization of uncertainty and quantification. If you think about each grid block being basically it's a pixel, bigger pixels are less certain, less resolution, smaller pixels are more certain, higher resolution, but you can still put your interpolated results within. So you get the high res picture with the uncertainty error bars around them. Um, that's another piece that we're looking to weave into the tool so that when this gets used wherever, not just in the Gulf of Mexico, um, folks can improve their predictions of subsurface properties, but also understand uncertainty associated with it. Particularly if the uncertainty is great in a location that you're most interested in, that may tell you you need to do more data collection or field studies or other fundamental work to fill in those gaps. And there's an opportunity to, to eventually evolve this for real-time response capabilities, real-time adaptive learning. If you think about LWD, SWD, um, integration of you know, data coming in from the field. Um, and we've been a, a expanding the use of the method for carbon storage, rare earth element, uh, resource characterization and hydrocarbon related work um, in other parts onshore and offshore of the US. Um, again, I said this at the front, I'll say it one more time, JO data science takes a team. And this is, this is you know, back when we could actually stand together <laughs> here in Oregon um, in front of our, our lab building. Um, and this is, this is the team from two years ago. Um, our team is always evolving and also our collaborations with outside partners has been critical and key. We have some really good conversations going, like I said, even with folks there at the BEG now around this topic and a few other efforts we're working on. Um, LANL, PNNL, other labs that we work with, um, as well as industry. And, and so we, we really value teamwork and collaboration. Um, and the group that you see listed here encompasses all sorts of disciplines from physics to computing science, environmental modeling, reservoir modeling, petroleum engineering, geosciences of all different types, um, geostatistics, conventional statistics, and I probably have missed, oh, compute, I think I said computer science and big data science. And this doesn't even include the, the parts of the team that are, are back in our West Virginia and, Pit and Pennsylvania offices either. Um, so, I just want to thank everyone. I know this was sort of a tour 
um, of this method uh, throughout the slides there or folks know how to contact me we do have the publications out they are available as links from this site as well um, on the sta method that dives much deeper into the nitty-gritty details of the method and over the next year or so you'll start to see the pubs coming out on the aiml integration um, components that i that touched on briefly at the end uh, so thank you again for your time and for this virtual experience i know it's always a little different than the in-person, but uh, hopefully there's some good questions. And at this point, I'll uh, open the floor. All right, uh, Katie, thank you very much for your great talk. And so far, I do not see any question in the chat box, um, but I'm curious about uh, the tool that you developed, uh, the SDA tool. Is it uh, open to the public? Is it an open source tool? It will be an open source tool. We are not yet, we have not yet um, released it to the public uh, because it is still in beta development, but um, we have, you know, when we get to a point and we're pretty close at this, at this stage, um, you're always welcome to reach out to us. We're always <laughs> eager for beta testers, feedback from, you know, peers and colleagues. So um, don't let that stop you. Um, my email's right here. Um, I, Mackenzie, Mark Moser, Patrick, Patrick Wingo is our lead tool developer. He's an environmental modeler and, and computer scientist on the team. Um, and Mackenzie's co-PI with me on this project now that in the AIML phase. So um, between the three of us, we're more than happy to, to chat with folks. And when it's appropriate, we, we end up sharing tools like this um, with like a select group and soliciting feedback, et cetera. And, and eventually, yes, it will be available for download on the, the EDX site, the Energy Data Exchange, which is FE, DO, Department of Energy's uh, fossil energy data and, and, and modeling um, curation site. Oh yeah, sounds good. Looking forward to that. So uh, I can see that Toti has a question. Toti, you're welcome to unmute. Hey, Kelly. Hey, that was a really nice talk. Hey, I got a... Um, Question on using unstructured data. I mean, on the, on the data science side, you know, we're sort of driven towards using structured data, right? It's sitting in tables. It's kind of with a bunch of uh, data management, it's kind of ready to go and you, know, you can make your classifications. But on the, on the geology side, you know, I think almost all geologists kind of live in the, uh, the, the unstructured data realm, right? It's very descriptive. It's the, uh, I guess the, the art that you were saying. Yeah. Um, I guess on my side of it, I've used the structured data to kind of try to validate things after the fact, but I haven't used it. I'm sorry, the, uh, I've used the uh, unstructured data to try to validate, you know, after the fact, once the models run, but I've struggled with putting it in the front end, you know, using it in the training data sets. Uh, what have you guys done on that kind of trying to take the, uh, the unstructured contextual data and put it in the front end of the training models, training data sets? Mm -hmm. That that's a big component of the domain definition for sure, Tody. That's um, that is exactly what that that piece is trying to get at. Um, if I if I back up to the take a sec, but um, <laughs> sorry. So. The geologic system knowledge is that unstructured knowledge exactly like you were saying and in the manual approach that's that is where you're using um, your your experts your geologists your geophysicists your geochemists to to come together and and you know work on okay how did this rock form i'm not sure if these little pop-ups are blocking things so i'm gonna try to there we go um you know uh, you have to sit, and this is this is the conventional way of doing it. This is where we're trying to get the machine learning AI component to to help inform this piece. I still think there's a strong role for the experts who understand the literature, have looked at the maps and the cross sections, have looked at you know prior studies, and understand the system to then say, I think this location went through a common lithologic, structural, and diagenetic history because it saw you know, salt tectonic deformation with, you know, you know, sediment loading from the delta front and we see from core analyses, da, 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 da. And it's that unstructured knowledge that you're talking about, the expertise that sits in the literature and in people's minds that you need to sit there and, and 
and talk through, this is why I think this deserves to be a family, a genetic family location that has seen a common history unto itself. And it is an iterate, and then you use the statistics from the measured data to, to go back and, and validate and see if that, that makes sense. Um, we go into more detail in some of the published, in the two published papers and report on it, um, on that process, on that iterative process. And if, if you want, we can always set up a conversation in more detail to, to walk through it. But that is 100% that, is that step early on in, and it's iterative. It's not, that's what these arrows are trying to, Try, it's, it's hard to, to, to put it into a workload, but it is an iterative process because you have to hypothesize. I think these are our domains and you see these are some of the early domains that we started with. And then you go through and you test it and you've got outliers that aren't, that aren't making sense. And you're like, okay, well, does this point belong to, to a different domain and change the boundaries? Um, the hierarchical clustering and the, 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 the machine learning piece is actually, we think going to help, help with the knowledge component and bring it together um, more rapidly and make it more, um, more, more data driven, but still incorporating that knowledge expertise front to, to, to validate, like you said, before you get into the advanced analyses. Thanks. Sure. All right, uh, Bridget just made a comment. Uh, great pre presentation, Kelly. I appreciate your webinar. Last fall related to RE is in code. Uh, liked your emphasis on S structure and diagenesis the, the uh, that are on, on the radio. Yeah, it's, uh, well, and it's, there's less measurements. I mean, the structure, I mean, structure is tricky and these are harder things to, to measure. I mean, when we think about the subsurface of our planet, we actually know less about the subsurface of our planet from direct measurements than we do about the surface of our moon, where we can, you know, use satellite imagery and other um, remote detection techniques to, to, to get, you know, to explore it. Um, we're, not, we're not superheroes, we don't have x-ray vision. So it's, you know, we, we can use tools like seismic and well logs, et cetera, but those are costly. Um, and th that's exactly that point, you know, the, the, the diagenetic history is often locked up in the, the literature based on what people have observed. Um, and, but it's so important because it tells you something about the system and where you know a family may have forked, where where an area may have seen a slightly different history from the, the location next to it, um, and and these boundaries are not meant to be hard boundaries. These are fuzzy boundaries because this is a continuous system. Um, but but again, just like genetics in humans, these clusters, these pods should have more in common within the pod relative to the system as a whole. Um, as opposed to you know what's going on in the next pod over, and that's that's what the statistics and the analyses that I was just talking with Tardy about as well, and that's that's exactly right, Bridget. We've been we've been expanding this for a resource assessment method that we're working on for rare earths in coal and sedimentary strata, and critical minerals to try to improve prediction of where you would find find rare earths and critical minerals and at any concentration that is above you know, detection limits, but also for, for resource character, you know, evaluation, um, hopefully techno and economic um, hurdles eventually. And so you, you do have to rely, I think, on the knowledge for the structure and the, the, the secondary alteration pieces and the secondary alteration in particular um, a lot more right now, but I'm hoping in the future there will be opportunity to, to again, resurrect some of that knowledge back into actionable data that can be used as well. All right, thank you. Next question is from Jit. Uh, Jit, would you like to unmute your mic? Uh, well, uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Kelly, for your presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, that how does your technique uh, consider results from different interpretations? I mean, sometimes we use the same data set from the same area and come up with different interpretations. So does STA consider one final interpretation or can we actually consider several interpretations from several interpreters at the, at the same time? Um, you could absolutely do that kind of a um, nuanced iterative approach. Um, so she and it's 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 what we've designed it to to be able to to hopefully with the tool in particular facilitate is um, 
is you know get to a point where we can do more rapid um, re recasting basically you know look for those fuzzy boundaries it looks you know it's a little misleading right now with these with these domain boundaries which are which are informing the the analyses the statistics and the advanced analyses that are they're coming they look like hard boundaries but they really aren't and that's a, that's part of what you're speaking to there's other you know there's uncertainty there's wiggle room there there's there's changes in interpretations, there's, you know, uncertainty in measurements. Um, and so being able to do, I don't want to say Monte Carlo style simulations, but multiple casting, multiple, multiple simulations to look for where there's more wiggle, more, more uncertainty versus less is incredibly important. And part of why we're trying to put this into um, that more um, supported tool type of a workflow. So you can do that kind of iterative what if I use this interpretation versus this interpretation and then get to using those, those boundaries, those very variations. Um, if, you, if you're not sure which one that you prefer, they both look robust. You can then use those for variances um, in something like the VGM tool. Or if you decide you prefer one over the other based on your expertise, you wanna be able to explain it, but it gives you that, that power of doing iterative analysis um, to explore and, and constrain. So, so that's, that's the, there's a couple different ways to handle the multiple interpretations. It again comes down to the subject matter expert in some regards, but it, it's also you know, basically how you can use the tool going forward or just the method now. Um, to, to recast, repredict. And, and we did a lot of that <laughs> um, in, the, in the initial phases of developing the method and validating it. Like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't this pretty picture right out of the gate. We did a lot of iteration, looking at different interpretations, looking at different products to, to hone in on what looks robust from the knowledge side and what is the data backing up and using the data for that validation as well. All right. Next question is from uh, Kion. Uh, Kion, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Kelly. This is a very a good talk. So um, I'm curious um, on like um, how like STA quantifies uncertainty of your predictions or like uh, what AI or statistical uh, techniques were used for uncertainty uh, quantification. For uncertainty quantification, there's a few different, you know, at different steps through the workflow. Um, you know, you can use regression analysis and some of just the basic um, data exploration steps. But um, and then with the you know the advanced analysis, so there's the short answer. Sorry, is that there's different tools that are available that you should be using throughout each step. And it's part of that interrogation, that geostatistical and statistical analysis up front, um, conventional uncertainty, um, you know, R squared and and uh, robustness of fit. And then you saw in the interpolation with the Kriegen, co Kriegen, um, on that analysis side, there was the conventional um, interpolation error um, that we we actually had to 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 interrogate and and look at and and assess to to understand the robustness of the predictions that were coming out. Um, but then there's more advanced methods, and on the AIML front, um, I would I would defer to uh, Anuj and Brendan, who are I'm not sure if Anuj is on the line, but if you want to dive deeper into some of the methods that they're using, I will definitely refer you in their direction. Um, as far as is you know what we've been doing there. Um, but then the VGM method is actually a published approach that uh, Jen Bauer and myself put out in 2015 um, that allows for uncertainty quantification and visualization uh, in three-dimensional systems like what, what is being shown up here. This is a, a VGM output um, that is looking at you can use very, you can you can quantify it in different ways, and this is one of the biggest challenges in spatial systems, including subsurface, but just spatial systems as a whole. Uh, you know, in graphical space, people are pretty comfortable with error bars and confidence intervals and more, um, you know, conventional statistical tools for quantifying and, and visualizing um, error and uncertainty. 
Um, in, in spatial and subsurface systems, that uncertainty quantification is a field unto itself. There are some, you know, Roger Genham and some of the, you know, other experts in the field that um, are still exploring different methods and tools to, to, to try to improve that. Um, but what we did with BGM is basically said, you can use whatever your preferred method is. You can use your interpolation error. You can use your sample density. Um, you need to pick something that represents the uncertainty in your system or to uh, Todi's point earlier on the unstructured, or no, sorry, I think it was Jeet's question just recently. If you've got different interpretations and you start running multiple simulations, that starts to give you a quantification of error and tolerance. It depends on, um, you know, what you're trying to represent with that uncertainty. Uh, but, but with the VGM tool, you can then represent that uncertainty in the three-dimensional space, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a number of different ways to do it. Um, and which one is the, the best suited depends on which step you're at in the method. Um, and also on a, a bit on your expert preference and, and what advanced analytic methods you're using in the final steps. Thank you. All right. There is uh, one comment from Ashley. Uh, great talk, Kelly. Thanks for sharing this work. Yeah, Ashley uh, and I used to work together at an ETL many years ago. So what do you? All right. I do not see any, any more question in the chat box. So we can end the session at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly, for, for your time and for your great presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye.